Hello and welcome back to Classic Books with Star, Jamie, Chloe, and Lily. As always, I want to remind you to please stay safe, healthy, hit the like button, subscribe, comment below, and the notification bell. And don't forget to check me out on Patreon. Without further ado, let's get into this video. All right, today we are going to get back into Victor Hugo's Les Miserables. Miserables. <laughs> and we are on book eight. Let's see. What's the name of that I'm forgetting? Let's see. Book eight. The Twilight Wane. And we are on part two. Other Backward Steps. The following day, at the same hour, Jean Valjean came. Cosette did not ask him any questions, was no longer astonished, no longer complained that she was cold, no longer talked of the drawing room. She avoided saying either father or monsieur John. She let him speak as he liked. She allowed herself to be called Madame, only she, so, only she showed slightly less joy. She would have been sad if sadness had been possible for her. Probably she had had one of those conversations with Marius, in which the blub man says what he pleases, explains nothing, satisfies the blubbed woman. The curiosity of lovers does not go very far beyond their love. The ground floor room had dressed up little. Basket eliminated the bottles and Nicolette the spiders. Every succeeding evening brought John Valjean at the same time. He came every day, not having the strength to take Marius's words otherwise than to the letter. Marius managed to be out when Jean Valjean came. The house became accustomed to M. Fock Levin's new way of life. Toussaint explained, Monger was always like that. She would repeat, the grandfather decreed, he is an original, and everything was said. Besides, past 90, no further tie is possible. Everything is juxtaposition. A newcomer is an annoyance. There is no more room. All the habits are formed. M. Falk Levin, M. Trank Levin, Grandfather Gill and man asked, nothing better than to be relieved of that gentleman. He added, nothing is more common than these originals. They do all sorts of odd things, no motives. The Marquis de Can Canapolis was worse. He, sought, uh, he bought a place to live in the attic. There are fantastic airs some people put on. Nobody caught a glimpse of the gloomy underside. Who could have guessed such a thing, actually? There are marshes like that in India. The water seems strange, inexplicable, quivering when there is no wind, agitated where it should be calm. You see on the surface this boiling without cause. You do not notice the hydra crawling at the bottom. Many men have a secret monster this way, a disease that they feed, a dragon that gnaws them, a despair that inhabits their night. Such a man seems like others, quite normal. Nobody knows that he has within him a fearful parasitic pain with a thousand teeth which lives in the miserable man who is dying of it. Nobody knows that this man is a gulf. It is stagnant but deep. From time to time a turmoil of which we understand nothing shows up on its surface. A mysterious wrinkle comes along, then vanishes, then reappears, an air bubble rises and bursts. It is a little thing. It is terrible. It is the breathing of the unknown monster. Certain strange habits to come at the time when others are gone. Shrink away while others make a display. Wear on all occasions what others might be called the wall-colored mantle. Seek the solitary path. Prefer the deserted street. No, not mingle in conversations. Avoid gatherings and festivals. Seem well provided yet live poorly have though rich one's key in pocket and candle with the doorkeeper come in by the side door go up the back stairs all these insignificant peculiarities wrinkles air bubbles fleeting folds on the surface often come from an awesome core several weeks went by this way a new life gradually took possession of Cosette the relationships marriage creates the visits the care of the house the pleasures those grand affairs, Cosette's pleasures, were not costly. They consisted of a single one being with Marius, going out with him, staying at home with him, 
This was the great occupation of her life. It was a joy still new to them, to go out arm in arm in full sunlight in the open street, without hiding in plain sight, all alone with each other. Cosette had one vexation. Toussaint could not agree with Nicolette, the welding of two old maids being impossible, and went away. The grandfather was in good health. Marius argued a few cases now and then. Aunt Gill and a man calmly led that peripheral life besides the, beside the new household, which was enough for her. Jean Valjean came every day. The disappearance of familiarity, the madam, the monger John, all this made him different to Cosette. The care he had taken to detach her from him was working. She became more and more cheerful and less and less affectionate, yet she still loved him very much, and he felt it. One day she suddenly said to him, you are my father. You are no longer my father. You are my uncle. You are no longer my uncle. You are Monger Falk Levin. You are John. So who are you? I don't like all that. If I didn't know you were so good, I would be afraid of you. He still loved in the Rue de la Homarne, unable to make up his mind to move farther, than, f farther from the quarter where Cosette lived. At first he would, <coughs> <coughs> he would stay with Cosette only a few minutes, then go away. Little by little, he got into the habit of making his visits longer. It was though, as though he took advantage of the examples of the days, which were growing longer. He came earlier and went later. One day, Cosette inadvertently said to him, Father, a flash of joy illuminated John Valjean's gloomy old face. He corrected her. Say, John. Ah, true, she answered with a burst of laughter. Monjour John. That's right, she said. And he turned away from, away so that she would not see him wipe his eyes. Part 3. They remembered the garden in the Rue Plumet. That was the last time. From that last gleam on, there was complete extinction. No more familiarity. No more good evening with a kiss. Never again that word so intensely sweet. Father, at his own demand and through his own complicity, he was driven from every happiness in succession. And he endured this misery that after having wholly lost Cosette in one day, he subsequently had to lose her again little by little. At last, the, at, the eye grows accustomed to the light of a cellar, and short to have a vision of Cosette every day sufficed him. His whole life was concentrated in that hour. He sat side by side. Saw, he sat by her side. He looked at her in silence. Or rather, he talked to her of the years go long gone, of her childhood, of the convent, of her friends of those days. One afternoon, it was one of the early days of April, already warm, still fresh, the season of great cheerfulness in the sunshine. The gardens that lay below Marius's and Cosette's windows were feeling the emotion of wakening. The hawthorn was beginning to peep a jeweled array of carnations spread out across the old walls. The rosy snap dragon escaped in the cracks between the stones. There was a charming beginning of daisies and buttercups. In the grass, the white butterflies of the year made their debut. The wind that, minst that minstrel the eternal wen w wedding tried out in the trees the first notes of that great auroral symphony which the old poets called the Renaissance. Mari said to Cosette, We have said that we would go to see our garden in the Rue Plumet again. Let's go. We mustn't be ungrateful. And they flew away like two swallows toward the spring. That garden in the Rue Plumet seemed like the dawn to them. Behind them, they already had something like the springtime of their love. The house in the Rue Plumet held on a lease, still belonged to Cosette. They went to this garden and this house. There they found themselves again. They forgot themselves. That evening, at the usual hour, Jean Valjean <coughs> came to the Rue des Filets du Calvaire. Madame has gone out with Monsieur and has not yet returned. Basque said to them, him, he sat down in silence and waited an hour. Cosette did not return. He bowed his head and went away. Cosette was so intoxicated with her walk to the garden, so happy over having lived a whole day in her past, that she did not speak of anything else. The next day, it did not occur to her that she had not seen Jean Valjean. How did you get there, Jean Valjean asked her. We walked, and how did you return? In a fiacre. For some time, John Valjean had noticed the frugal life the couple led. It annoyed him. Marius' economy was severe, and John Valjean took the word in its absolute sense. 
he ventured a question. Why don't you have a carriage of your own? A pretty brougham would cost you only 500 francs a month. You are rich. I don't know, answered Cosette. It was the same with Toussaint, continued Jean Valjean. She has gone, and you have not replaced her. Why not? Nicolette is enough, but you must have a lady's maid. Don't I have Marius? You ought to have a house of your own, servants of your own, a carriage, a box at the theater. There's nothing too good for you. Why not take advantage of being rich? Riches add to happiness. Cosette did not answer. John Valjean's visits did not grow shorter. Far from it. When the heart is slipping, we do not halt on the descent. When John Valjean wanted to prolong his visit, make the hours pass unnoticed, he would eulogize Marius. He found him beautiful, noble, courageous, intellectual, eloquent, good. Cosette outdid him. John Valjean began again. They were never silent. Marius, this word is inexhaustible. There were volumes in the six letters. In this way, John Valjean managed to stay a long time to see Cosette, to forget at her side that was so sweet to him. It was a st stanching of his wound. Several times, Basque had to come down twice to say, Monsieur Gillinger man sends me to remind Madame the Baron that dinner is served. On those days, Jean Valjean returned home very pensive. I, I love it, uh, Jamie. Was there then some truth in that comparison of the chrysalis which had occurred to Marius? Was Jean Valjean indeed an obstinate chrysalis who came to visit his butterfly? One day he stayed longer than usual. The next day he noticed that there was no fire in the fireplace. Well, well, he thought, no fire. And he explained it to himself. It is quite simple. Here we are in April. The cold weather is over. Goodness, how cold it is here, exclaimed Cosette as she came in. Why no, said John Valjean. So it is you who told Bass not to make a fire. Yes, we are almost to May, but we have a fire until the month of June. In this cellar, it is in need of the year round. I thought the fire was unnecessary. That is just one of your ideas, replied Cosette. The next day there was a fire, but the two armchairs were placed at the other end of the room, near the door. What does that mean, thought John Valjean. He went to pick up the armchairs and put them back in their usual place near the fireplace. The kindled fire encouraged him. However, he continued the conversation still longer than usual. As he was getting up to go away, <coughs> Cosette said to him, My husband said a funny thing yesterday. What was it? He said, Cosette, we have an income of 30,000 francs, 27 that you have, three that my grandfather gives me. I answered, that makes 30. Would you have the courage to live on 3,000, I answered? Yes, on nothing, provided it is with you. And then I asked, why do you say this? He answered, just to know. Jean Valjean did not say a word. Cosette probably expected some explanation from him. He listened to her in mournful silence. He went back to the Rue de la Home arm. He was so deeply absorbed that he mistook the door, and instead of his own house, he went into the next one. Not until he had gone up about almost two flights did he notice his mistake and go down again. His mind was racked with conjectures. It was obvious that Marius had doubts regarding the origin of the 600,000 francs, that he feared some impure source. Who knows? That he had perhaps discovered that this money came from him, Jean Valjean, that he hesitated in the face of this suspicious fortune, and disliked to take it as his own, preferring to remain poor. <coughs> he and Cosette, then to be rich, with a doubtful wealth. Beyond that, Jean Valjean was vaguely beginning to feel that he was being shown the door. The next day, on entering the ground floor room, he had something of a shock. The armchairs had disappeared. There was not even a chair of any kind. Ah, now, exclaimed Cosette as she came in, no chairs, so where are the armchairs? They are gone, answered Jean Valjean. That's a pretty business, Jean Valjean stammered. I told Basque to take them away. I t and what for? I'll only stay a few minutes today. Staying a little while is no reason for standing up while you do stay. I believe that Basque needed some armchairs for the salon. What for? You undoubtedly have company this evening. Nobody's coming. Jean Valjean could not say another word. Cosette shrugged. To have the chairs taken away. The other day you have, you had the fire put out. How strange you are. Goodbye, murmured Jean Valjean. He did not say. Day. Say goodbye, Cosette.
but he lacked the strength to say goodbye, madame. He went away overwhelmed. This time he had understood. The next day he did not come. Cosette did not notice it until late that night. Why, she said, Monsieur John has not come today. She felt something of a slight pang, but she had hardly noticed it, immediately diverted as she was by a kiss from Marius. The next day he had not come. He did not come. Cosette paid no attention to it, spent the evening and slept as usual, and thought of it only on awaking. She was so happy, she sent Nicolette very quickly to Monsieur John's to know if he was sick and why he had not come the day before. Nicolette brought back Monsieur John's answer. He was not sick. He was busy. He would come very soon, as soon as he could. However, he was going on a short trip. Madame must remember that he was in the habit of taking trips from time to time. There should be no anxiety. Let them not be troubled about him. On entering Monsieur John's house, Nicolette had repeated to him every the very words of her mistress, that Madame sent to know why Monsieur John had not come the day before. It is two days since I have been there, said Jean Valjean mildly, but the remark escaped the notice of Nicolette, who reported nothing of it to Cosette. Part 4. Attractions and, and Extinction During the last months of the spring and the first months of the summer of 1833, the scattered wayfarers in the Marais, the storekeepers, the idlers on the doorsteps, noticed an old man neatly dressed in black every day, but at the same time at nightfall come out of the Rue de la Homme Arne in the direction of the Rue Saint Croix de la Bretonnerie, but passed by the Blanc's Manteau to the Rue Culture Saint Catherine, and reaching the Rue de la Acharpe, turned to the left and entered the Rue Saint Louis. Terry walked slowly, his head bent forward, seeing nothing, hearing nothing, his eyes immovably fixed on one point, always the same, which seemed studded with stars to him, which was nothing more nor less than the corner of the Rue des Filets du Calvaire as he approached the corner of the street. that street. His face lit up, a kind of joy illuminated his eye like an inner aura. He had a, fa he had a fascinated and softened expression. His lips moved vaguely as if he was speaking to someone whom he did not see. He smiled faintly, and he moved as slowly as he could. You would have said that even while wanting to reach some destination, he dreaded that the moment when he would be near it, that when there was just a few houses left between him and the street that appeared to attract him. His pace became so slow that at times you might have supposed he had stopped moving. The vacillation of his head and the fixedness of his eye reminded you of the compass needle seeking the pole. However long he managed to defer it, he had to arrive at last. He reached the Rue des Filles du Calvaire, then he stopped, he trembled, he poked his head with a kind of gloomy timidity <coughs> beyond the corner of the last house, and he looked into the street. And in that tragic look there was something like the bewilderment of the impossible and the reflection of a forbidden paradise. Then a tear, tear who had, which had gradually gathered in the corner of his eye, grown large enough to fall, slid down his cheek, and sometimes stopped at his mouth. It's my opinion, Mara should be ashamed of himself. The old man tasted its bitterness. He stayed like that a few minutes, as if he were made of stone. Then he returned to the, by the same route, and at the same pace, and with the widening distance that looked gradually faded. Little by little, the old man stopped going as far as the corner of the Rue des Filles du Calvaire, who stopped halfway down the Rue St. Louis, sometimes a little farther, sometimes a little nearer. One day he stopped at the corner of the Rue Culture St. Catherine and looked at the Rue des Filles du Calvaire from the distance. Then he silently moved his head from left to right, from right to left, as if he were refusing himself something and retraced his steps. Very soon he no longer went even as far as the Rue St. Louis. He reached, reached the Rue Pavie, Pavie, shook his head, and went back. Then he no longer went beyond the Rue des Troy Pavilions. Then he no longer passed the Blanc's Manteau. It was like a pendulum that has not been wound up, and whose oscillations are growing shorter before they stop. Every day he left his house at the same time began the same walk, did not finish it, and perhaps unconsciously he continued to shorten it, continually shortened it. 
his whole count countenance expressed this, this single idea. What is the use? His eyes was, eye was dull, the radiance gone. The tears had also stopped flowing. They no longer gathered at the corner of the lids. That thoughtful eye was dry. The old man's head was still bent forward. His chin quivered at times. The wrinkles of his thin neck was, were painful to see. Sometimes, when the weather was bad, he carried an umbrella under his arm, which he never opened. The good woman of the quarter said, He is an innocent. The children followed him laughing. Book 9. Supreme Shadow, Supreme Dawn. And it's the last book in Les Miserables, Part 1. Pity for the unhappy, but indulgence for the happy. It's a terrible thing to be happy, how pleased we are with it, how all-sufficient we think it being in, in being in possession of the false aim of life, happiness, how we forget the truth, <coughs> the true aim, duty. We must say, however, that it would be unjust to blame Marius, that's what they're saying, I blame him. As we have exclaimed, plain, explained before his marriage, Marius had not asked M. Bach 11 any questions. And since then, he had been afraid to put any to John Valjean. He had regretted the promise he had reluctantly given. He had reiterated to himself many times that he had done wrong in making that concession to despair. I mean, if he just thought about it, you know, I mean, John Valjean obviously took care of Cosette, saved his life. Maybe, you know, yes, we blame Marius. I think he's being selfish. He had nothing more than gradually, he did nothing more than gradually banishing John Valjean from his house and obliterating him as much as possible from Cosette's mind. Terrible. He had, in a sense, con constantly placed himself between Cosette and Jean Valjean, sure that in that way she would not notice him, and would never think of him. It was more than obliteration, it was eclipse. But that's going to catch up with him in karma. Marius did what he deemed necessary and just. He supposed that for keeping Jean Valjean away without harshness. But without weakness, he had serious reasons, which we have already seen and still others, which we shall see further on, having chance to meet in a case he had taken. A former clerk of the house of Lafitte, he had obtained, without seeking it, some mysterious information which he could not actually probe to the bottom out of respect for the secret he had promised to keep, and out of con consideration for John Valjean's perilous situation. At that time, he believed that he had a solemn duty to perform. The restitution of the 600,000 francs to somebody whom he was seeking as cautiously as possible. In the meantime, he obtained, abstained from using that money. As for Cosette, she was in on none of these secrets, but it would be hard to condemn her, too. There was an all-powerful magnetism flowing from Marius to her, which made her do instinctively and almost automatically whatever Marius wished. In regard to Monsieur John, she had felt, str felt a strong wish from Marius. She conformed to it. Her husband had had nothing to say to her. She felt the vague but clear pressure of his unspoken wishes and obeyed blindly. Her obedience in this cons consisted in not remembering what Marius forgot. That took no effort for her. Without knowing why herself and without affording any grounds for censor, her soul had so thoroughly become her husband's soul that whatever was covered with shadow at Marius' thoughts was obscured in hers. We must not go too far, however, in things to do with Jean Valjean. This forgetfulness and obliteration were only superficial. She was thoughtless rather than forgetful at heart. She really loved the one whom she had so long called father, but she loved her husband still more. It was this that, some, that had somehow somewhat swayed the balance of his heart. If it wasn't with John Valjean, he probably wouldn't be alive. Somewhat swayed the balance of his heart, inclined in a single uh, direction. It sometimes happened that Cosette spoke of John Valjean and wondered. The Marius would calm her. He is away, I think. Didn't he say that he was going off on a trip? That is true, thought Cosette. He was in the habit of disappearing this way, but not for so long. Two or three times she sent Nicolette to ask if the Rue de la Homme arm, Monjour, John, had returned from his journey. John Valjean had the answer sent back that he had not. Cosette did not inquire further, having but one need on earth, Marius. 
We must also say that they too, Marius and Cosette, had been away. They had been to Vernon. Marius had taken Cosette to his father's grave. Marius had little by little drawn Cosette away from John Valjean. Cosette was passive. Moreover, what is called, much too harshly in some cases, the ingratitude of children is not always as reproachable as is supposed. It is the ingratitude of nature. Nature, as we have said elsewhere, looks forward. Nature divides living beings into the coming and the going. Those going are turned toward the shadow, those coming toward the light. Hence a separation, which on the side of the old is a fatality, and on the side of the young, involuntary. This separation, at first imperceptible, gradually increases, like every separation of branches. The limbs, without parting from the trunk, recede it from it. It is not their fault. Youth goes where joy is, to festivals, to brilliant lights, to loves. Old age goes to its end. They do not lose sight of each other. But the ties are loosened. The affection of the young is chilled by life, that, that of the old by the grave. We must not blame these poor children. Two, part two, the last flickerings of the exhausted lamp. I'll move up here a little bit. One day, Jean Valjean went upstairs, went downstairs, excuse me, took three steps into the street, sat down on the stone block on that same block where Gavroche on the night of the 5th of June had found him musing. He remained there a few minutes, then went upstairs again. This was the last swing of the pendulum. The next day he did not leave his room. The day after that he did not leave his bed. His concierge who prepared his frugal meal, some cabbage, a few potatoes with a little pork, looked into the brown earthen plate and exclaimed, Why, you didn't eat a thing yesterday, poor dear man. Yes, I did, answered John Valjean. The plate is still full. Look at the water pitcher. That is empty. That shows that you have drunk. It don't show that you've eaten. Well, said John Valjean, suppose I have only been hungry for water. That is called thirst, and when people don't eat at the same time, it is called fever. I will eat tomorrow, or at Christmas. Why not today? Do people say I'll eat tomorrow to leave me my whole plateful without touching it? My new potatoes, which were so good? John Valjean took the old woman's hand. I promised to eat it, he said to her in his benevolent voice. I am not pleased with you, answered the concierge. John Valjean scarcely ever saw any other human being than this good woman. There are streets in Paris in which nobody walks, and houses into which nobody comes. He was in one of those streets and in one of those houses. While he still went on, he had bought from a brazier for a few sous a little copper crucifix, which he had hung on a nail opposite his bed. The cross is always good to look at. A week elapsed, and John Valjean had not taken a step in his room. He was still in bed. The concierge said to her husband, The good man upstairs does not get up any more. He does not eat any more. He won't last long. He has trouble. He has. Nobody can get it out of my head that his daughter has made a bad match. The, the porter replied with the accent of the marital sovereignty. If he is rich, let him have a doctor. If he is not rich, let him not have any. If he doesn't have a doctor, he will die. And if he does have one, he will die, said the porter. With an old knife, the concierge began to dig up some grass that was sprouting in what she called a pavement. And while she was pulling up the grass, she muttered, it's a pity, an old man's who's so nice. He's white as a sheet. She saw a doctor from the quarter going by at the end of the street. She took it on upon him herself to beg him to go up. It is on the third floor, said she to him. You can simply walk in, as the good man does not stir from his bed now. The key is in the door all the time. The physician saw John Valjean and spoke with him. <coughs> when he came down, the old woman questioned him. Well, doctor, your old man is very sick. What is the matter with him? Everything and nothing. He is a man who, to all appearances, has lost some dear friend. People die of that. What did he tell you? He told me that he was well. Will you come again, doctor? Yes, answered the physician. But another then, I should come again. Part 3. I'm over again. A pen is heavy to him who lifted Falk Levin's cart. <laughs> One evening, John Valjean had difficulty in rising up on his elbow. 
He felt his wrist and found no pulse. His breathing was shallow and stopped at intervals. He realized that he was weaker than he had been before. <coughs> and undoubtedly, <clears throat> under the pressure of some supreme desire, he made an effort, sat up in bed, and got dressed. He put on his old working man's garb. As he no longer went out, he had returned to it, and he preferred it. He had to stop several times while dressing. The mere effort of putting on his jacket made the sweat roll down his forehead. Since he had been alone, he had made his bed in the living room so as to occupy this desolate apartment as little as possible. He opened the valise and took out Cosette's clothing. He spread it out on his bed. The bishop's candlesticks were in their place on the mantel. He took two wax tapers from the drawer and put them into the candlesticks. Then, although it was still broad daylight, it was in summer, he lit them. You sometimes see candles lit this way in broad daylight in rooms where the dead are lying. Each step he took in going from one piece of furniture to another exhausted him, and he had to sit down. It was not ordinary fatigue that spends the strength in order to be renewed. It was the remnant of possible motion. It was exhausted life, pressed out drop by drop through overwhelming efforts never to be repeated. One of the chairs under which he sank was standing before that mirror, so fatal for him, so providential for Marius, in which he had read Cosette's note, reversed on the blotter. He saw himself in this mirror and did not recognize himself. He was eighty years old. Before Marius' marriage, one would hardly have thought him fifty. <coughs> this year had counted for thirty. What now marked his forehead was now, were now not the wrinkles of age, but the mysterious mark of death. You sensed on it the imprint of the relentless talon. His cheeks were sunken. The skin of his face was of the color that suggests the idea of earth already above it. The corners of his mouth were depressed, as in that mask the ancients sculpted on tombs. He was staring into space with a look of reproach. He looked like one of those great tragic beings who rise in judgment. He was in that state, the last phase of dejection. When sorrow no longer flows, it is as if co coagulated, the soul covered with a clot of despair. Night had fallen. He laboriously drew a table and an old armchair near the place and put on the table pen and ink and paper. Then he fainted. When he regained consciousness, he was thirsty. Unable to lift the water pitcher with great effort, he tipped it toward his mouth and drank a swallow. Then he turned to the bed, and still sitting for the... He could not only stand for a moment, he looked at the little black dress and all the beloved objects. Some Such contemplations last for hours, which seemed minutes. Suddenly he shivered. He felt that the sh chill was coming. He leaned upon the table that was lit by the bishop's candlesticks, picked up the pen. It was neither pen nor ink had been used for a long time. The tip of the pen was back, bent back. The ink was dried. He was obliged to get up and put a few drops of water into the ink, which he could not do without stopping and sitting down two or three times, and he was compelled to write with the back of the pen. From time to time he wiped his forehead. I think Marius is doing exactly what his grandfather did he, to him. His hand trembled. He slowly wrote the few lines which follow. Cosette, I bless you. I am going to explain something to you. Your husband was quite right in giving me to understand that I ought to leave. While there's some mistake in what he believed, he was right. He is very good. I always love him dearly when I am dead. Oh, and your pont mercy always loved my darling child, Cosette. This paper will be found. This is what I want to tell you. You will see the figures, if I have the strength to recall them. Listen carefully. The money is really your own. Here is the whole story. White jet comes from Norway, black jet comes from England, the black glass imitation comes from Germany. Jet is lighter, more precious, more costly. We can make imitations in France as well as in Germany. Requires a little anvil two inches square and a spirit lamp to soften the wax. The wax was formerly made with resin and lamp black and cost four francs a pound. I thought of making it with shellac and turpentine. This costs only thirty sous and, is made, and it is much better. The buckles are made of violet glass, which is fastened by means of this wax to a light frame of black iron. The glass should be violet from, for iron trinkets and black for the gold trinkets. 
Spain purchases many of them. That is the country for Jap. Here he stopped. The pen fell from his fingers. He gave way to one of those despairing sobs that arose at times from the, strength, the depths of his being. The poor man clasped his head with both hands and reflected. Oh, he cried inwardly, pitiful cries heard by God alone. It is all over. I will never see her again. She is a smile that has passed over me. I am going to enter in the night without ever seeing her, even seeing her again. Oh, a minute, an instant to hear her voice, to touch her dress, to look at her, the angel, and then to die. It is nothing to die, but it's dreadful to die without seeing her. She would smile at me. She would say a word to me. Would that harm anybody? No, it is over forever. Here I am all alone. My God, my God, I shall never see her again. At that very moment, there was a knock at the door. That is the end of uh, part three, and I will, we got another 28 pages left in this book. Once I finish reading, I will uh, summarize the whole of John Bell John. But if you enjoyed this video, please be sure to hit the like button, subscribe, comment below, hit the notification bell, and check me out on Patreon. And as always, please stay safe and healthy and have a great day. Thank you.